Who are we going to do, me or her? Well, you know, if you want to talk about the, 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 what was, what's the same and what's the difference, and if the difference is beer and passing through it, then that's really important. Uh, just hold it, hold it just a moment. Ready, Jimmy? Okay. Mother, you remember back when you used to tell me how y'all did at Cannon Mills? I was just little, but people would come down the road in a moving van and they'd run and look out the window and stop the trucks and tell them if they'd stop, they'd give them a well, house and a job I, too. I don't know, uh, that's what they told us when we come to Canapolis, but they'd stop them up at that service station, Lakeview service station, and tell them if they had a house to put them in and had a job for them. Yeah, I'd like to see it get back to that. I'd really love to see them have to beg for help for some of the dirt that they've done to oh, the people that work there. I could quit in one part of the mill and go to another part and get a job and put right on to work. She worked in the spinning room. How many years did she work in the spinning room? I don't know. I went to work in 1920. 37 years. And then out of the blue sky, they transferred to a weed room where she don't know nothing about nothing. That's right. She was all to pieces then. I thought for a while she was just going to quit and give it up. But she toughed it out. But they've had some dirty deals up there. I've had some handed to me in that mill. Okay. Yeah, she was she was one of the first ones that went to work up there at the Plant 16 when they first built Plant 16 up there. She had been working in a weed room and they sent her up there to go to work on them pseudocomas. I mean, soils, excuse me. But now we have three generations of in the cannon mills here, but it's not the kind of cannon tradition that we see celebrated in that little museum no Tell it's, about that. it's it's nothing like the museum anymore back when i first went to work up in the mill well they they were they were real grandmother's generation in the mill was real proud to work at cannon mills dad's generation in the mill was real proud to work at cannon mills and when I first went to work in the mill, I was too. You know, it was cannon mills. Everybody was proud. When you see that little cannon label on something, like when I got to California and I seen that little old bitty label cannon on something in the motel room, the towel in the motel room had cannon right on. I mean, I felt like, hey, I'm from here, you know. It was great. I, I loved that cannon. When they tore that, they tore that cannon off that building over there, it just broke my heart. You know, I cried. I couldn't stand it. But my grandmother and them, in her generation, I. I guess that if they were aware of what we're aware of, they would have organized. If they would just knew what their rights were, if someone would have explained it to them, they would have probably organized. They were, they, were, they were afraid of a union, but they were happy with their job. It was a good place. They got equal opportunity. Like they said, you can go from one department to another department. We can't do that. We can't, we can't quit a job and go back to work. If we quit a job, I mean, that's it. You know, it's all over for us. And Dad, it was basically the same way with Dad when, when Dad was up there, other than the last the last four years he worked up there, you know, while Murdoch controlled the stock, it wasn't like that. But before that it was just it was great while the cannons had it. Yeah. And he they really didn't they really didn't push for a union. They they really didn't need to be organized because they got whatever they, got they wanted. They wanted. I mean it wasn't it wasn't hard on nobody and uh, they give out papers out to me on the union, they come around a lot of times. Give out the papers, people look at them. I read every one of them. They had some good points in there. But I mean, uh, we was getting treated right. Wasn't nobody being run over, and I had a good job. Didn't work hard, didn't hurt myself. I said, well, and they never did get enough, you know, to, to form a boat on. So, it's like I say, it was, it was all happy with our jobs back then, but you know how it changed when this uh, Murdoch took over. Everything went bad then. They, they really need one now. Dad, what would you have done if you could have foreseen that Murdoch was going to come in here and tear it up? If you could have known back in 74 what I tried to tell you in 80 was going to happen and it did happen, what would you have done in 74 if you'd have known how it was going to be today and your pension was going to be tucked from you and you didn't, you didn't have no rights whatsoever? in the mill. What would you have done in 74? How do you feel well, about that? What could you have done? You could have either, you could have voted, but what good did it do if there wasn't enough of them to vote on it? They come in there and they had us, uh, you know, we're between number seven and number six, they had that whole place out there full. Oh, Holt, he was a good man over it. And they talked to us out there for an hour about the union. We went around different places and talked to them. 
and got them turned against it. I mean, they didn't need that because they were getting treated fair. Well, a lot of them was. I mean, they couldn't complain because that was a can of meal, you know, still on it. And they was. They had a pretty good job. But it's like I say, it's changed now, and your pension, just like I talk about pension, they took away 30% and get by with it. They'd have to come back later and want 30 more cents. And well, One of the big changes that I've noticed, we've been looking at movies of, of textiles in the 20s and 30s and now, and the, it's just very different because there's so many black people in the mill. Yeah. Could you talk about that big change? How does that look to you? Well, it made a change, but they, they got by with more. Now, I had a bunch of black people I trained in there to weave, and they come in there, and they got by with more than the white did. Now, I don't know. It, well, see, Cannon, he was, I mean, the government, federal government forced it on him. He had to put so many black people in there, and they had to put so many as a boss man. I know we had one there. They took him right off his job and put him with another boss man. He stayed for about two years before he learned the job. And... They had to hire so many. There was supposed to be a certain percentage in the place. And they run over him, he couldn't do nothing about that. But the federal government, they paid so much for training them people. You know what, they got so much out of each trainees. And I've had them to quit, stay out a week or two and come back on the same job. How is it, how is it now? Well now, the, as far as the racial thing, the racial issue is now, well, back when I first went to work, it was like, like Dad said, you know, like they got by with a lot more than we do, we did. We had to pretty much walk a straight line, you know, and, and they really couldn't fire a black or a, well, we didn't really have any Hispanics, you know, or Orientals or anything. That's just been here lately that they've started coming in. But um, it was pretty much, it was pretty much that way when I first went up there. But now it's like when you get to talking about, talking to them now, they, they're after the same thing we're after. We're after equal rights and freedom, you know, <coughs> freedom to uh, speak what we want to speak and, and just do our job, stay off our back, just let us do our job and we'll do it, you know. And uh, <clears throat> treat us like humans, treat us all equal. And they're after the same thing I'm after. Well, I've got a, I've got a lot of black friends, you know. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not the least bit prejudiced. And, I had, they were, when, back when I was a kid I was, you know, I mean, we didn't ride the same bus, you know, <laughs> you wouldn't do that, but uh, after, after it, they, they started uh, segregating the schools, and we, we fought that a long time, and, but after, after they segregated, segregated the school, I got some black friends, and, uh, and then they started bringing them in the mail, you know, and I, I got to be friends with a lot of them up there, but uh, now it's like we're we're standing up for the same thing, like what they were standing up for. I couldn't understand what Dr. King was, his issues. I, I wouldn't understand it. I turned my head to it. You know, I turned a death ear to that man, you know, and I hate that because he was a, he was a great man. <laughs> I mean, he, 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 he knew then what I'm, I know now, and uh, it took me 20 years to figure it out. But um, we stand together. I mean, I've got... I've got people that come up to me who are black and they ask me questions and I go up to the black people and ask them questions. We're as one. We're united. Whether we get a union in, whether we get a contract, or whatever, we're going to stand together, every one of us. Black, white, Hispanic. we got Hispanic people that don't understand English. But I talk, I talk to them through an interpreter. <laughs> I know a little bit of Spanish and I can understand most of the time what they're saying except for the ones that come from El Salvador. I can't understand them. They talk so fast. you know. But, uh, I've got I've got people that interpret that, or interpret for me up there, and I talk to the Hispanics too. I just don't know any Orientals up there that get to interpret for me. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I've got. I've, it's interesting that at NYU I've got all of these different people in my classes, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating how quickly you you start looking at it as individuals. But it does take a while. It does. Yeah. It took me 20 years, I, I guess. I was uh, I was pretty much prejudiced, you know. Just about, about say that again. Okay. It, it took me 20 years. I was pretty much prejudiced back, you know, when I was young. Coming up, we had race rights. We had race wars. We fought. Doggone, I, I've been expelled a bunch of times from school, and they didn't even know I was expelled from school for fighting racial fights. You know, but 
I busted the principal's windshield out of his car one time with a black guy. <laughs> but uh, after they after they got in, I seen that they were gonna be there and they were there to stay. Here, 20 years later, you know, I I don't have a prejudice bone in my body. You know, I guess I was, but after I figured out what the truth was and what freedom meant, you know, I guess figuring out what freedom means is the main and the main thing is the main thing. It's kind of so it's a, it was a learning experience the last 20 years, but I'd, I'd say for, in 1980, well, in 1976, I went in the Army, and I was in the, the barracks with black people, and I was this close to them. And I learned then. I learned what it was all about. I got to talking to them. My best friend's name was Armando Perales. <laughs> there was no way I could be prejudiced with Armando. <laughs> and... Uh, I had a buddy, when I was in California, stationed at Mar uh, Fort Ord, I had a friend from Concord, he's a black guy. Can't remember what his name was. Sorry if you were watching, <laughs> but I couldn't remember what his name was. Uh, but we were we were in the same squad, and uh, matter of fact, we rode back and forth to California together several times, and uh, he taught me a lot about, uh, about prejudice, you know, and being as one, standing up, equal rights and stuff like that, what, what Armando didn't teach me. It was a learning experience. How far did you go in school? I, I finished school. I, I graduated with a GED. I, 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 I finished um, 10 months in the 12th grade, and I quit two months before graduation. <laughs> but I got a GED. <laughs> 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 I, I got married. <laughs> <laughs> I got married and had to quit school. <laughs> Plus I work full time in the mill, you know. I had I had my own home. <laughs> okay, uh, Judy, you want to take over? Can I we think? take a break or something? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, if I can get <laughs> have some cutaways here, we can do it. Fishing Creek, yeah. That's the last mill house I believe I lived in. When. Okay. When you uh, when you first went to work up here in the mill, grandmother, did you uh, did you live in a mill house? Mm -hmm. When you came and got your job, they put you in a mill house. No, then? Uh, well, they told us we could get a house. We we was living in Mooresville and riding the bus over here to work. And then uh, sis and uh, then we. Uh, oh, well, I stayed with uh, Harrison, Florida, when I first come here, and then we they gave us a house so we would get a house where we wanted. So we moved over here. Then moved on Nair Street. I was over here in Ten Cup. Was you uh, was you living in the mill house when the uh, union tried to get in? Mm -mm, no. Huh. You wasn't. Was you ever scared that if you do something wrong in the mill, that you would get evicted? No. They'd kick you out of the house if no. they fired you. Mm -mm. You wasn't ever scared of that. No. You had to work to keep your house. I know I did. What, what, you, didn't that frighten you that you might do something wrong and then they, and then you'd lose your house? Mm -mm. No. Well, I was working under C.A. Cannon. He yeah. didn't have to. Yeah, I was working under <laughs> Cannon. They had no, they had no reason to be afraid back didn't then. You work for them. You didn't keep the house back then. Uh -huh. You had to work in the mill. You couldn't rent the house unless you worked for them. But their rent was so cheap, boy, anybody had... House back then, I mean, it, it flood on up to Cannon Soda. Their house rent was real cheap. Long well, my aunt lives over here on Walnut and Murdoch Road. She lived on Mulberry Street for 47 years in the same house. They built a room onto it and added a bath. And their rent was $15 a month. Now she's paying $60 a month. She's an old lady now. She's 84 years old, living on a fixed income. And that gets rough. Now you jeopardize yourself if you living in a house that belongs to him or to the company. You got to walk the chalk line. Well, Murdoch don't even allow you to pay, take a flower up out of the yard. But I told my sister-in-law, I said, them Brazilians out there, my brother bought them. Murdoch didn't have nothing to do with that. I said, I'm going to take flowers up and they go to my house. She said, I'll give you anything out here in the yard you want. I said, well, don't you think I, I won't take it out? 
<coughs> uh, the man lived by the side of her told me, he said, all right, so she take every flower out of this yard. He said, Murdoch will be on you before you know it. I said, I'm not scared of Murdoch, and I don't work for him either. Don't live in one of his houses either, do you? <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the things that has impressed me as uh, somebody who's just looking into textile families is that there seem to be a very close relationship uh, the generations. Not only people seem to look after their parents and grandparents, but there seems to be a lot more uh, support between men and women than you see in other places like steel where it's the man who goes out and makes the work and the woman stays home in cotton it seems to be that the women so much work in the mills that way even way back yonder you had two income ha uh, families is there anything connected with that that's made it easier to organize i think the um i think we all we all pretty much know what we're going through like grandmother knows what i'm going through as a loom fixer Dad knows what I'm going through as a loom fixer because grandmother was a filling hand in the weave room. Dad was a weaver in the weave room and I fixed the looms that dad wove on and she laid the filling up on. Uh, we pretty much know what we're going through. We, knew, we know how hard we have to work and we pretty much stick together, you know. I mean, it ain't like steel mill where they might run off and I'm not working in the steel mill and they move across the country somewhere. We, we pretty much all stick together, you know. Like I live about I live about three miles from mom and dad here, but grandmother, like they take care of grandmother. And when they get old, I'll take care of them. You know, they'll come on over to my place. And uh, basically, just about everybody in you know in cotton mill work sticks together like that. You know, because we know what we're going through, and we all been there. And it's pretty much a tradition, you know, to stick by your family like that. Good. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about these fear tactics that they've been using. These movies and the, those closed captive meetings and that kind of thing. I wonder if you could talk about that <clears throat> and how that's affected people and how people have been able to, to not be affected by it. I'm sure you're one of them. And, uh, and also describe one of those movies for us in detail, how they've been using history, old historical movies to try and counter the Union. Okay. Well, when the, when the Union first came to the gate and they started passing out the green cards this time, I was there that night. And uh, I went in and I, I filled out my green cards, you know, when I come out, I was going, I dropped it in the bucket. Well, was just a few nights later and they had a, they had a movie about, let's see, it was uh, Mr. Fitzgibbon, I believe it was, got on there and told us all to stick together that, and that he had... Uh, he had been in poverty like we had, you know, with his $528 an hour salary. He had been struggling just as if we had. And, you know, I, that was, <laughs> I, I got a good laugh out of it, you know. <laughs> we making $9.49 an hour as a loom fixer. And um, I, uh, I kind of laughed it off. But now there's some people that, are antis who laughed that off too because they realize this guy's he's never been in poverty I mean he's come from a rich family and he was hired into the Fieldcrest family it by a rich family that was associated with his family that bought the company that his family owned you know I know how this guy <laughs> I know where he came from came from but then they started they started showing these movies now uh, this is hearsay I, I know the words that was said in the movie but I didn't get to see the pictures because I was not there. I went to the first uh, captive audience meeting when it was mandatory and the second mandatory meeting I was excluded from and every mandatory meeting after that I was excluded from and they also one of my black friends that fixes on the section beside of me they excluded him from the second one not because he asked questions at the first movie I mean at the first meeting but just because they, would, they didn't want to show no discrimination, you see. So they kept both of us back, a black and a white. And then everybody went to the second movie. A lot of people asked questions, and they kept them out of the third movie. And then when they went to the fourth movie, they asked questions, and they kept them out of the fourth movie. You know, the captive audience meetings is what I'm trying to say. 
but uh, they were, I believe they were still mandatory at that time. But I think the last two meetings or the last three meetings, they, they said that they could go if they wanted to, you know, they didn't have to go. It was basically to find out who was going to vote yes and who was going to vote no. That's basically, so they could work on the inter intermediate people and get them to vote no was what it was about. Because we all knew, <laughs> we knew who was going to vote yes and who was going to vote no right from the beginning, you know. And uh, we just worked on the ones that were going to vote no. Anyway, um, as these captive, captive audience meetings, they, they told a lot of horror stories in there about um, union strikes. Mostly was about the coal workers' strikes, the coal miners' strikes, you know, which we have nothing to do with whatsoever. But uh, I think Act Two was, which is the union that uh, that I represent or represents me. Uh, Act Two was involved in a couple strikes, and they they got that on film, you know, and they showed that to them. Here's these people that's trying to get into your company which it don't have nothing to do with them. By the way, they won those strikes. They won those negotiations that they were striking for at that time. And um, there was just, just strikes from Chicago, you know, places. And uh, the, bus, the bus driver strike, I believe it was, that there was so much violence at, they showed that, you know, like as if here they are, Phil Crest Gate, you know, beating each other up. It had nothing whatsoever to do with us. It was just a scare tactic. And I believe they swayed a lot of votes with those scare tactics. Probably 50% of their no votes came from there. Now, one of the things that I've commented on, and maybe you could comment on it, is that this has been the most peaceful labor experience that I've ever observed and the most orderly and disciplined. Uh, how did, was that brought about? That. The reason it has been peaceful is because just we're... Want, are we getting it too heavy? It's, it's there, and it, it, if you want to let it wait, let's let it wait. Let's not wait, because this... Uh, <laughs> you you want to bring that in as a question? No, you can just assume that I've asked the question. Okay. Well, uh, um, Talk about peaceful. Oh, the reason it, it was so... It's such a peaceful campaign was because these, these anti-union people and us union supporters, we're, we're all in the cotton mill. We all work under the same conditions, although they do show a, a good bit of prejudice towards us organizing type people, you know. Um, we're, we're still in the same place doing the same jobs and we're virtually a, ha a family, you know. We're, we're not a happy family, but we're a family. We know each other real good. and. Like I seen my brother-in-law, <laughs> my best friend, my supervisor, several guys that worked beside of me all standing on the other side during the vote count, you know. They were, they were on, on the company side. And I, there was no way, they didn't speak to me, I didn't speak to them, but there was no way I'd go over and say a harsh word to them and they wouldn't say a harsh word to me. It's, we're going to campaign, we're going to work this thing out. And we're not going to fight. There's no reason in fighting about it. I've, I've got into some pretty heated discussions and I say well if you don't want to talk about it, uh, civilized you know in a civil tongue you know we, maybe we'll talk later maybe you've got something else on your mind right now that's uh, in several house calls I had you know and several times in the mail you know we're gonna be civilized about this and or we're not gonna talk about it at all but they wanted to talk about it uh, lots of times I didn't get my point across because they start arguing with me you know but um, it was a very peaceful campaign very peaceful. They were, there was no violence whatsoever. None, not none, no violence. And uh, there weren't there weren't no profanity, no no verbal violence, no drinking. Uh, it's just it's in the South, you know. It's got, everybody drinks beer, you know. But um, we didn't have no no drinking whatsoever. It mostly was out of common courtesy. Every bit of it, like. I don't come to my mom and dad's house and drink a beer. When they come over to my house, if I happen to be drinking a beer, I'd put it down, you know, or if I see them come in the door, I'll put it in the trash. I don't drink around them, it's courteous. It's courtesy, that's about, about being a southerner, you know, you're gonna be courteous to each other. And the same thing goes with the campaign. 
it goes with anything you do in life. If you go to, if you go down here one of these car lots, you won't see no high pressure salesman. You're gonna see a southerner, or else he's not gonna be from here. He's gonna be courteous to you. He's gonna treat you like a human, you know. And I, I, we don't, we don't have that management in the mill anymore. They're not courteous to us. Charlie Cannon was a southerner. Amen. He was courteous. Mm -hmm. He treated us like we were one of his family. We were a southerner. Now, these people from up here in Michigan or Boston or wherever they're from, you know, they're not like it. They're not going. They're not going to. They're not going to do us no favors. I mean, they talk about they're going to take our. They might take our vacation pay away from us. You know, like we have to be off a week without any pay. There's some people up there that gets average four weeks pay a year. You know, because they've been there over 25 years. We don't have that in writing. Mm -hmm. They can take it tomorrow, just like they did his sal uh, pension, you know. They can do that. They're not courteous whatsoever. I mean, that that tradition in the mill is gone, but it's still here. Mm -hmm. We're still courteous. We're courteous to them people, you know. My brother-in-law, I'm not going to mention his position or anything, but he's, a, he's one of the top people in the mill up here. I'm just as courteous to him, to him as I can be. I hadn't been to see him in three months, but there's a purpose. The reason I hadn't been to see him is out of my courtesy towards him. I didn't want none of his folks in the mill to think that we were elaborating, you know. And my folks knew we wouldn't, but I didn't want anything to happen to him. My best friend is a supervisor in the mill. I mean, me and him seen each other probably three or four times a week. You know, we, we went out at least once a week, usually before this election, I mean, before the campaign started. But out of courtesy, I don't go to see him. But I will real soon, <laughs> probably this weekend, you know. But it's, it's over. I didn't want anybody to think we were elaborating. That's courtesy. Now, back in 34, we've been talking to a lot of people who were there. The, the, they keep telling us that the, that the mills were riddled with spies. Did you run into anything like that here? No. So you mean spies like inside management? No. We didn't we didn't have anybody inside management and I don't think any management had anybody around us, you know. They could have. I mean all it would have meant was when they went to the booth they could have checked no. And they could have been one of us. I'm not saying they didn't, but I I didn't hear of any. You know, I think it was in that aspect, I think it was a pretty good deal. I mean, they didn't know where we were coming from when we hit with one campaign, you know, one campaign phrase, they didn't know it was coming. But we pretty much knew what they were going to do. <laughs> How did you find out? Well, it's just, it, it was like 1984, I mean 1985, all over again. Mm -hmm. The same speeches, the same campaign tactics, everything. I mean, you could almost tell, let me, let me, let me guess, let's see, it's the third week in election. This must be talking about strikes. Ah, it is talking about strikes. I mean, you know, it was exactly like 19... It must have been the same law firm as 1985. But the faces were changed. There was Mr. Fitzgibbon instead of Mr. Murdoch begging you not to vote for the union. Now, I'll do this and I'll do that. You know, they didn't... The thing about it, what I couldn't understand about the no's, they, um, the no voters, they didn't offer them nothing. You know, they didn't say... I'm not going to stop paying you for vacation week, or I'm not going to stop your pension plan. And they didn't say, we're not going to go up on your insurance. They didn't say none of that. They didn't promise. They didn't, they didn't promise a lot like Murdoch did. See, Murdoch said, well, I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to stretch you out, and stick with me. We'll be one big happy family, and then turn around and sell the meal the next two weeks later, two months later, whatever it was. Turn around and sold it, you know. Why do you think? they got a majority. Why did they get a majority? They ain't got a majority yet. <laughs> the 538 votes ain't been counted, my friend. <laughs> they ain't got no majority. There's 199 votes, and there, there are 199 votes in the lead in this race, and we're going to win. Mm -hmm. One way or another. It might take us another year, but we're going to win.